Uh, we're going to spend, as I mentioned earlier, I said earlier, uh, the morning uh, with uh, the team at Lapop talking about what you see up on, on, on the screen. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, and, and as they've reported, uh, uh, this particular report, 2014, uh, is, is a bit of a milestone if you consider, as I mentioned, that they've collected over the 10 years and can identify certain patterns over the last 10 years on behavior and public opinion and attitudes and so forth about political culture in the region and a whole host of questions and issues. And, and so I think we're going to be having some of that discussion to identify certain trends, certain findings over the last few years so that maybe you could tell us something about uh, some of the issues that, that Chris raised um, uh, in the morning. Let me, what we're going to do is we are going to have the Lapop team here do presentation uh, of about an hour or so. And we're going to follow that up by the two discussants, or that I'll introduce in a second, for about 20 minutes. And then I think we should have some time for question and answer. Uh, there's going to be, I think, a lot of data, a lot of a lot of interesting stuff. So make sure to take uh, take notes uh, while 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 we go through the, the the morning. Let me just briefly introduce each of our uh, panelists here uh, today. Uh, first, uh, Elizabeth Seichmeister is uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Latin American Public Opinion Project, LAPOP, at, uh, at Vanderbilt University. She received her PhD uh, at Duke University in 2003, and she's the author of numerous articles and book chapters and reports dealing with public opinion, security, uh, voting, and ideology. Uh, and she's the author of several books on, on these topics. Uh, next to her is Mitchell Seligson, uh, is the Centennial Professor of Political Science, a professor of sociology at Vanderbilt University, and a member of the General Assembly of the Inter-American Institute <clears throat> excuse me, of Human Rights. He is the founder and directs the Latin American Opinion Project, LAPOP, that currently, uh, as the report indicates, covers 28 countries in the Americas in the report, in the 2014 report. He has been a Fulbright Fellow and has received grants and fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation. Uh, he has been very much a part of this project, as you can imagine, working very closely with the USAID and others. He served in the National Academy of Sciences and a panel studying the impact of foreign assistance democracy and is appointed member of the OAS Advisory, Advisory Board. Matthew Singer is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Connecticut. He holds a PhD also from Duke University in 2007, is affiliated researcher with uh, LAPOP at Vanderbilt University. His research focuses on accountability, electoral accountability, democratic attitudes, and the interaction between party systems and political be uh, behavior. And he's the co-editor of the forthcoming book, Latin American Voter. Our two discussants, uh, first, uh, my colleague, uh, Eduardo Gamarra, uh, professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at FIU, and most importantly, uh, former director of the Latin American Caribbean Center. Uh, he's uh, author of numerous works on Latin America and the Caribbean, and he has testified numerous times also uh, before the U.S. Congress on Latin American Caribbean uh, issues. He's a consultant for a number of NGOs, and other governments throughout throughout the region, and a long record of uh, advising and consulting um, throughout the region. And finally, uh, Greg, Gregory Weeks, uh, he's a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, he is uh, the author of, a, um, uh, of an important blog, a little plug for you there, uh, Greg, uh, Weeks Notice uh, dot blogspot dot com. Uh, I follow it religiously. Uh, and his most recent book is Understanding Latin American Politics. Thank you all, all of you for, for being here. Uh, it's really an exquisite pleasure for me to be here at FIU. Uh, I, I can, I'm old enough to say I remember when, and I remember when Jack Hood Vaughn was here in the earliest days when this was no more than a runway. Uh, Jack who swore me into the Peace Corps before anyone in this room was born and and uh, and to come back at this institution and see the magnificence and how it's how it's grown 
Of course, that's all related to my own hypothesis that its current president followed me in graduate school, and I sort of taught him the ropes, and out of that emerged this institution. Uh, and I make sure I keep close track of what Mark Rosenberg is doing for you and to you as the days go on. Uh, but it really is terrific to be here, and I want to thank Jose Miguel for organizing it, Frank, for, for inviting us, and especially Ruby, Ruby sitting there, Ruby, who is without Ruby, I don't know, we would all have expired a long time ago, but there's never a night or a weekend that Ruby isn't able to respond to virtually any question I have. Um, I'll be setting the, 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 uh, the tone of the discussion today by talking to you about the themes that we'll be dealing with and telling you a little about the data. And it, won't be very, it won't be painful, I won't be getting into regressions and things like that, but then turn it over to Liz to present the, the core of the findings, and, uh, and then from there we'll get, a, we'll get a little bit further down into the discussion, uh, and I'll end up coming back with some final comments on the bigger picture on democracy, so we can, we can do all those things. Um, this is the presentation that the three of us will be making today with, with me first, Liz and, and Matt. But it, I, me first, but it's a little odd because now Liz is first. That is, after many years of nurturing the project, uh, it's also a pleasure to see Liz having taken over as the director. She is, as I say, the man, and I say that all the time. And, and she always has a funny smile on her face when I say that. <laughs> but, uh, but Liz is really in, is really in, in charge, and I'm a, a supporter of the, of the project as, a, as an advisor. Getting to the core of it, what we'll be dealing with today. Um, the, the America's Barometer 2014, as in previous rounds, is an extraordinarily rich data set. Um, and we have much to talk about, but we're going to limit ourselves to a small number of points um, rather than trying to give you an omnibus of everything we've dealt with. And we're going to be looking at the problem of crime. Crime is really a problem for the, re, uh, the, for the region. That's no surprise to anyone in this room. But the insecurities that people face in their daily lives and how it affects what they do is what we want to focus on here today. But crime is only one side of the coin and corruption is another. Corruption has been high in the region for a long time. As you'll see from the data, it doesn't seem to be trending down in any, any important way, which is surprising given that economic growth and declines in corruptions are supposed to go together. Um, and it has an impact. It affects the way people think about their governments and, uh, and, the, and they think about the, the democracy. And finally, our theme will be dealing with democracy. That is, democracy remains the only game in town, as I think I'll be able to show you quite easily. It's not that anyone is supposing, proposing that we introduce fascism or communism as a system of rule, but at the same moment, um, there are a lot of serious concerns about the nature of democracy, specifically on support for the system, and to take a theme that already emerged in our keynote address on questions of political tolerance. Um, and let's, uh, we'll, and, but first, let me then give you sort of a brief primer on the data, and we won't refer to any of the findings and leave that um, to my colleagues until the end. Um, I have to take a deep breath when I think about where the America's barometer has grown over the years. The earlier surveys um, began in Costa Rica, um, where I was a Peace Corps volunteer and was the only place in Central America at the time where you could do a study like this of democracy without endangering the respondent or the interviewer, um, having him hauled off to jail or worse. And, um, and then the project grew, and in 2004, we formed the Americas Barometer because we felt we were really covering a broad enough region to say something about the Americas. And in that period of time, we've conducted nearly a quarter of a million interviews. And I think back, wow, that's amazing. And it's only on the Americas Barometer, not to speak of all of the specialized samples we do and are doing as we speak right now. We do cover 28 countries, as was mentioned a moment ago, and it's the only household survey then that covers North America, Central America, South America, and a growing part of the Caribbean. And I'll put in my plug right now because the one part of the Caribbean, that one thing that's blank in there that's really important is Cuba. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If someone here has some way of our being able to, to, um, to uh, work out an agreement that we can do our surveys without interference on the part of the government, that we would, be, that we would like to be the first to sort of be there and, and be on top of this to bring Cuba into the fold, as it were. I kind of think of about it as well. Ping pong diplomacy brought China in. Maybe a survey can ultimately bring Cuba into the fold. Um, we do about 1,500 interviews per country, although as you've seen in a moment, we do a lot more than that in some countries. 
And these are, I want to say right at the beginning, nationally represented surveys, not least nationally representative surveys. That is to say, people ask me after we finish a whole discussion like this, yeah, but is this just the city? Are these just the rich people? Are these just students? These are rich and poor, urban and rural, young and old, men and women, black and white, and so on. We cover the population so that when we speak about Bolivia, or we speak about Nicaragua, or we speak about Mexico, we are speaking about the country. And then in the analysis that we do and that you can do with the data, since it's free and public, you can then subset that down to what interests you, females in rural areas who don't attend school and so on, those kinds of groups. Um, we do face-to-face -face interviews in all the countries except the United States and Canada because of the extraordinary cost of doing face-to-face, -face, and then we do web-based surveys in these, these two countries. But everywhere else, we are actually out there in the people's homes talking to them. And we work on, use many languages. Um, in our presentation the other day in, in uh, Washington, someone attended and had been spending time in Suriname, and there we work in Sarnan Tango, we work in Dutch, and we work in English, and we work in in Paraguay, as you, if you've been there, you know it's a bilingual country, and Guarani and Spanish are interchangeable, and we work in all those languages that are appropriate for the region. We spend a full year, actually more than that, developing the questionnaire and pre-testing the instrument. It takes us an enormous amount of time, but our interest as academics, as opposed to policymakers, is to get it right, to get the data set that all of us can analyze as a community and try to produce the best quality data. We're the only people who really spend that kind of time, that repeated pre-testing again and again and again, going back and back, because when the respondent doesn't understand it, it's our fault. We don't We've made a mistake, that we've asked them a question that they don't get, and we have to reword it until we make sure that we've communicated our highfalutin academic ideas at a level that people who don't have PhDs can grasp. We do enormous amount of quality control, uh, as you'll see in a moment now that we have um, electronic devices that allow us effectively to be nearly real time, we can really do that in a way that we've not done before. It's important to talk about the people who make it all possible. USAID has been a long-term supporter of ours from the earliest days before the Americas Barometer began and the work in Guatemala and then work in Bolivia and eventually growing to the position that we're in right now where we have a cooperative agreement with USAID and we've been supported by them. The Inter-American Development Bank has been for the past several years a major supporter of ours, allowing us to do things that we couldn't have dreamed of before, especially in the area of crime um, in major cities and in, the, in, the, in major urban areas. The Tinker Foundation, along with others, makes it possible for us to distribute the data worldwide. And there are a whole series of other donors. I'm not going to try to deal with the logos here because when I get to the next slide, you're going to see you're going to be uh, have a headache from all the logos. We are an association, a consortium of institutions, um, in which we work with think tanks and universities throughout the Americas. And I'm not going to even try to read any of these to you because you can see them all in the material. But basically, we have partnerships in each of these countries. It's not our show. It's their show. And they're the ones who not only help us form the core questionnaire, they're the ones who add on items. So we were just talking here a moment about Colombia. And the Colombia group, which is based at the University of Los Andes, has a lot of concerns about the peace process. And the questionnaire reflects that. And the questionnaire in each country reflects the particular concerns of that country so that we have core items and we have country specific items. This all converges in Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt at, at that photograph you see in the center top, which is La Pop Central. Uh, we have a, an outstanding group of staffers, eight of us, four PhDs and four people with master's degrees uh, who work literally day and night to get this thing done. It was. Um, it's always a, a panic mode. Will we make a December 1 deadline? Because unlike any of the other surveys, and I speak of, I speak of this openly, I'm a member of the board of the Afrobarometer, but there's a two-year lag before they release the data. We release the data in the year we collect the data, and we make it free to the world. There's no surcharges or hidden numbers or whatever. The whole world can get the data. And that's all possible because of this incredible group of staffers that worked so long and so hard to make it possible to make that, that deadline. Um, uh, the, the continuity is there, but there are a number of things that are first for 2014. In this round, we were able to add the Bahamas, and we're in the process, so with you, in the data set we don't yet have in it Barbados, but we're in the process of adding Barbados. Uh, I would like to say we're in the process of adding Cuba in the Caribbean, but so far we've been able to do that. 
Uh, and this round, we've conducted more than 50,000 interviews. Or, and when we finally add Barbados, we'll be significantly above that. Um, and that allows us to use large urban samples in selected Caribbean countries in order to be very precise on crime victimization, because while crime is very high, the actual incidence per person is relatively low, and we need to ask a lot of people questions in order to get the kind of data we need. I'll talk briefly in a moment about LASSO, our remote sensing efforts to improve sample designs, which should be of interest to scholars here who want to do their own surveys. And then we have an extended battery of questionnaire items on crime, and we've also included things that we will not at all touch on or hardly touch on here today on state capacity, the environment, disaster risk reduction, which is a major theme here at FIU, participation, domestic violence norms, attitudes towards China. I was just asked on, on, on Monday when this came out, did you ask about China? Yes, we asked. I said, Liz, did we? Yeah, we asked about China and, 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 and much more. So it's like the Prego tomato sauce. And it's in there. If you just look at the questionnaire, you'll, you'll find it. More technically, we interview about 1,500 people per country, but if you look at places like Bolivia, where we have support from the Embassy of Sweden, we're able to do 3,000 interviews and in dividing that in the, in the nine departments of the country. And if you'll see places like the Bahamas, where we have 3,400 interviews, this reflects the contribution of the Inter-American Development Bank to do oversamples of the major metropolitan areas. But essentially, you, you can we have 1,500. In fact, when you analyze the data, we weight everything so that all countries count for 1,500, so that no one country counts more than the other. And they all stop and say that some other surveys will then do it by population. That is, the bigger the country, the more it counts. And that makes sense in one sense, but the results then we would be presenting here would be Brazil. I mean, that's all we'd be talking about is Brazil. And all of the Caribbean and all of Central America would essentially disappear into a decimal point. Um, so we prefer to treat each country as a unit that matters. And the policies of Nicaragua versus the policies of Venezuela and the policies of Costa Rica and Mexico matter for our, our purposes. Here in the lower left, you see that picture of Lasso. One of the problems we face in surveys is dealing with a good sample frame. That is, we want to make sure that we actually do know how many people there are and where they're located so that we can make sure that every person has an equal and known probability of selection. Otherwise, we're overrepresenting one group or underrepresenting another. Uh, but that's difficult when either you have old census data or unreliable census data or census bureaus that don't want to cooperate with us, that won't give us or anyone else, for example, what we really need, which is the census maps that will show us every block and the households on every block and how we can count them and get the density on that block. So working with our, our, our lead computer gurus, we've developed for the first time, and we intend to make available uh, worldwide in the, in the first quarter of, of 2015, our, our LASSO program, the Laptop Survey Sample Optimizer. And what you see there in, in the black and white on the left is remote sensing of a resort, which is the equivalent of a municipal district, in Suriname. And there, we can, the user can click away, eliminating rivers. We don't want places where people don't live. We don't want river banks where people don't live. We want populated areas. And you can notice how dense the southern part of that area is versus how, how sparse the, the northern part is. And if you were to do it a sample without taking that into consideration, you'd get it all wrong because you'd be interviewing too many people up in the north and too few people down in the south. From that, we count the rooftops electronically. And that's what's on the right there in green. We're able to count the rooftops electronically, and then I turn that into a color photograph down there, and it's hard to see it, but there are squares in which you can actually tell you, tell you what the density per square is, and from that we can develop our samples. It's, a, I think, a unique advance. It is a unique advance that we we contributed, um, and you'll be hearing more about that as we move forward uh, next year. And our other advance, working with our partners first in Costa Rica when we had PDAs, and now with our partners in Cochabamba, Bolivia, we're using Android phones to carry out most of the interviews. Um, this is our Agis system, which you see up there, which allows us, for example, to just touch the screen and pick una vez a la semana, una dos veces a la mes, you know, whatever the answer is, without having to write a one, which can be confused with a seven, and therefore you don't know what the person really responded. But on top of that, we can switch languages. If you're in uh, Paraguay, you'll find yourself beginning a conversation in Spanish in the middle. Suddenly, you blank out because you've slipped over to Guarani. Okay. Here, the interviewer in the middle of a question can change the language, in this case in Bolivia, from Spanish to Quechua or Aymara, depending on the respondent's um, uh, 
preferred um, way of communicating. So that's one of the advances we do, and we're, we're really happy about that because it also allows us to, in real time, send those to a server and download them in Nashville that very day and look at the GPS coordinates and make sure the interviewer was right where he's supposed to be or she's supposed to be rather than the neighborhood bar. And we can also check on interviews that just don't seem right, that are too fast, that are done, being done too quickly. We have a quality control that we've never had before, and it's really... A, for me, a great feeling seeing where things began in the old days with a pencil out in the field to where we are today. Our samples, I mentioned, are representative. So it's a piece of cake to do that urban center in Bolivia. Just walk down the street, you carry out the interviews. It's not a piece of cake to work in low-density areas like this in rural Bolivia. But we get there. That is, we interview the appropriate number of people in urban and rural area. And it's especially difficult when we face these, these things that we found in Nicaragua. We're working on a special sample in the uh, Atlantic region, the southern Atlantic region of Nicaragua, looking at crime and, and drugs in that area. And here you get a sense of what we went through because this is just a couple of months ago, the rainy season had started and to get our interviews out there, they literally had to ford streams, take canoes and so on to get to the interview. It was really quite a, quite a process and, and, uh, that we went through. And then finally when we get there, we find out we have to interview in Mosquito. Okay, we've got to have interviewers who can speak Spanish, English and Mosquito in order to be able to carry out interviews like this. Otherwise, they lose that part of the population and then they have no voice and we want them to have a voice. Finally, our process involves this long effort. We pre-test, here's an interviewer, pre-testing in Honduras, pre-testing in Panama, pre-testing in the Dominican Republic. Then we go through a long process. Some of you may know Diana Orses, who's now a faculty member uh, in Michigan. She's training in Guatemala, uh, Diana being fluent in Spanish, English, um, and, and French, and here training in Haiti, uh, in Creole, okay, where we have, to, we have to get people who are Creole speakers. And so we go through that process. I guess I'm trying to say, um, you may not like some of our findings, and you may find them strange, um, but they're um, an order of magnitude more reliable than anything else that we know of that's being done in server research for the Americas as a whole. Finally, I mentioned the data are free. If you go to our website right now and on your handheld or whatever, you can click on survey data, right, Ruby? Uh, and, and, and that kept her up quite a bit. And you get free data access. And anyone in the world, and as we see all the time, people are downloading these data sets in China and places like that. Um, and that, and that we, you can get the, get the raw data and, and tell us you're lying. You made this up. Everything I just said is just a bunch of baloney. Well, you can, we, we have it out there so you can check. Um, and then finally today, that, that data released on Monday, today here at FIU, that Liz has it in her hand, we have this report. For those who don't like to get their hands dirty with the data, would rather read this summary uh, focused on a couple of key topics, but only a couple of key topics. You can read this report written by our scholars at Vanderbilt, <coughs> our staffers at Vanderbilt, and then people who are in this room uh, who, uh, who will be uh, uh, participating today. Uh, that took a, a huge amount of effort to get it done, but we, we hope to, we, in addition to that, we have reports that are in process, which are called country reports. So if you want to read more about Guatemala, you can pull out a 200 page report on Guatemala, all free, available in PDF format online. And with that, I'll turn over the bulk of it to Liz, who can tell you about what we found uh, in the survey. Okay, thanks. Well, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here today. We've been working toward this day for for over two years, and so it's just tremendously, um, you know, it's almost a thing where words can't express how how happy we are to be here today and to have the report uh, between covers back there for for you to take home with you uh, to look through during the course of today. We're very grateful to FIU for putting on this this really rich conference and to allow us to share some of the findings from the comparative report and then throughout the day to do a deep dive into special topics of interest to, to many of you in the room and um, also to focus on particular countries that are of, of interest. And there's a lot more, as Mitch said, so there's more in the in the comparative report that I'll be able to touch on to, uh, this morning and, and that Matt will be able to touch on with me. Um, there's also a lot more in the, in the country reports that will be coming. I want to start by saying that the, the, the data that we'll present to you this morning for the most part are data or analyses are based on the pooled data set. So this, so we're going to be talking a lot about regional averages, 
right? We'll show you some uh, charts that will where, where we'll be able to point out particular country averages or, or percentage percentage rates for, for, for countries on given variables. Um, but for the most part, we're going to be talking about the region as a whole. Okay, so when we think about the region as a whole and we look back over a decade of the America's Barometer, one of the headline messages uh, that comes out of our analyses is this, that citizens of the Americas are more concerned about crime today than in the past. And the image that you, that you see there is of Mariana Rodriguez uh, pre-testing in, in Venezuela. You can see um, just visually the, the levels of, of insecurity in in, in that country, but we see it across the region, and so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that. To put that in in context, and with a nod to Chris's comment that we, you know, weren't going to talk enough about the economy, I'm going to talk just briefly about the economy. In context, what we see over the past uh, decade or more is that the economies in the region have grown. On average, economic output for the region has been positive up until these past few years when, when things have slowed down. This is data from, from the World Bank. When we look at our data, and this comes from some analysis that Matt and, and his co-authors did for one of the chapters in the comparative report, when we look at our data, we, we look at uh, ownership of, of items in the household, and we use that to create an index of wealth. And we can see here that over the, the course of the, the survey when we were asking these questions from 2000 to 2014 that there's been a steady increase in household wealth on average for the region. I will say that in that chapter what you'll also find is that citizens are perceiving the slowdown. So wealth has increased but what the authors of that chapter point out is that economic insecurities are widespread in 2014. But in this context of overall positive returns over the last decade, what we see when we ask people about the most pressing problem, the most serious problem facing the country, is that the percentage of people on average across the region who are identifying an economic issue has been declining. So from 2004 to 2014, here you see the percentage, the regional average. Uh, here in 2004, 60% of people, when they were asked, in your opinion, what is the most serious problem faced by the country, they gave a response that we coded as economic. Right? It might have been really related to jobs or inflation um, or, or so, so something else economic, and we coded there. Right? And in 2014, that number is 35.8 percent, so a significant decrease. At the same time, what we see is a significant increase in concerns that relate to security. So in 2004, we have 22.5 percent of, of, of individuals on average across the region expressing a concern related to security, and that jumps up a full 10 percentage points so that by 2014, this year, it's almost 33 uh, per percent or one in three individuals are expressing a concern related to security as the most important problem facing their country. So. Uh, another way to look at this is to ask people about the safety that they feel in their in their neighborhood or how 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 concerned they are about their personal safety. We ask the question, speaking of the neighborhood where you live and thinking of the possibility of being assaulted or robbed, do you feel very safe, somewhat safe, somewhat unsafe, or very unsafe? And what we've what I'm going to do here is show you some average values, mean values on a 0 to 100 scale that we could call a perception of insecurity scale. And so these are the values for 2012 and 2014. And what you can see there is a significant increase for the region as, as a whole of, of perceptions of insecurity. People today in the Americas feel more insecure. One question that that, that sort of brings up is what are these concerns based in, right? Are, are these just, is this just sensationalism? Are people, are they, are they, are they, are they concerned for, for, for no reason? What are these concerns grounded in? And we do some analysis on that question in the report. One of the things that we can tell you is that people who pay more attention to the news are more insecure. They report higher higher rates of insecurity. So that maps on to some sense that there's that there's a, a pathway through through which sensational news stories you know affect or fuel insecurities. 
But at the same time, we also see that these insecurities are grounded in individuals' experiences with crime. So one way we see that is by looking at the relationship between perceptions of insecurity and whether or not the individual reports having been the victim of a crime over the past 12 months. So we ask individuals in the survey, over the past 12 months, have you been the victim of any type of crime? We give them a list of types of crime and then we tell them, or any other type. We're trying to get them to sort of remember back over 12 months any type of crime. And here I'm going to show you a graph that looks at those who re reported no, they were not victimized over the last 12 months, and those who reported yes. And on, on the, on the y-axis here, we see the, the perception of insecurity uh, variable. And so what you see is a very clear, significant re relationship between the, the crime victimization variable and perception of insecurity, that as you move from being not victimized to victimized, you are more insecure. So these perceptions of insecurity are grounded in, in, in citizens' experiences. They're, they're also affected by other factors, but, but, but crime matters. But what we want to also point out, and we, we try to do this in the report, and I want to do it here, is that the nature of crime differs across the Americas. So in the survey in 2014, we asked people to tell us about their awareness of different types of crime in their neighborhood. So were there burglaries in the last 12 months in your neighborhood? Have there been any sales of illegal drugs? in the last 12 months in your neighborhood? Have there been any uh, extortion or blackmail in the past 12 months in your neighborhood? Have there been any murders in the last 12 months in your neighborhood? And reports or awareness of these uh, different types of crimes vary so that on average in the region we see m much more reports of burglaries in the neighborhood than sales of illegal drug, more uh, sales of illegal drugs than murders, and fewer cases of extortion, of uh, people being aware of extortion. That's often a hidden, hidden crime, right? Well, now let's look across countries. So what we find when we look across countries is that the nature of crime varies significantly across countries. When we talk about burglaries, we see Argentina at the top. People are reporting high rates of burglaries in neighborhoods across Argentina. Now, these are not the rates. These, this should not be taken as the rate of, of burglaries in Argentina. Right? These, this is the percentage of people in Argentina, 71.8% in the survey, who are saying that they're aware of, of burglaries haven't happened in their neighborhoods. Right? So there's a heightened sense that, the, 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 that burglaries are, are happening and affecting people's, people's lives, the lives of, the, of, of their neighbors. If we look at where Argentina falls on the chart that compares reports of or awareness of, of murders in the neighborhood, you see that Argentina moves down significantly, down there. And we see the same pattern when we look at Uruguay. Right? Here's Uruguay up here on burglaries. Here's Uruguay down here on awareness of murders. Some countries go in the other direction. So here's Jamaica down here on burglaries. Here's Jamaica here on the chart on, on murders. When we look in the in the in the report at some figures that I don't, I'm not going to present for you this morning, but you can find them in the report at things like perceptions of insecurity or overall crime victimization rates, we'll see countries like Argentina and Uruguay toward the top of those of those charts. People in Uruguay and people in Argentina report high levels of insecurity, right? And that sometimes puzzles people. They say, but but isn't it you know why isn't Central America and you know above Argentina on 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 that chart? And the answer in part is that the nature of crime varies across countries. So people in Argentina and Uruguay are concerned. They're just concerned about different things than people in say Jamaica or 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 you know um, the Dominican Republic or Venezuela. Well, Venezuela and the Dominican Republic are actually at the top of both of these charts. So let me say uh, different from uh, what people in Guatemala are concerned about. So what are some of the costs? One of the things that we, one of the points that we try to make in the in the report is that um, crime victimization and the insecurities that it fuels drive individuals to alter their daily behaviors and also to augment their intentions to to leave the country. So when we look at that first question, we ask a question in the survey about the extent to which people have selected to change their route, their walking route through their neighborhood in response to crime in order to avoid. Uh, being the victim of crime, have you, you know, out of fear of crime, have you changed the the way in which you walk through the neighborhood to avoid what we might call hot spots, right? And regionally, 40% of of citizens of the Americas report altering their their routes uh, over the past 12 months to avoid walking through dangerous areas. A, a, 
topic that's come up uh, um, to a greater degree, perhaps, uh, than, than in recent years, uh, uh, the, is the topic of immigration, right? So we look in the survey and we have for years at intention to emigrate. We ask people, do you have any intention of going to live or work in another country over the next three years? And we ask people to just tell us yes or no. And one of the things that we see in the data when we compare 2012 to 2014 is an increase in intention to emigrate on average across the region. And we connect that in the analysis that we do to crime and insecurity. So here is just one uh, look at that. Here we're looking at whether or not the individual reports having been the victim of a crime, yes or no. And then the uh, percentage of people who fall into each of those two baskets that reports an intention to emigrate. So if those on average across the region who have not been victims of crime, about 20% of those individuals report intending to go live or work abroad. And that number jumps up to 27.6% when we consider those who have been the victim of a crime. These relationships we find over and over again, we, we find them when we look at perceptions of insecurity. We did a special report earlier this year where we looked at this set of connections in, in the Central American region. So if you don't already subscribe to our Insight series, I encourage you to go onto our website and, 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 and find the, the, the information there about how to get onto our, our free uh, Insight series. It will send you out regular reports such as this. You can also find these reports once they're distributed online. And in this report, the authors go into detail, as I said, on the Central American countries and the connection between violence and intentions to, to leave. Moving forward in the, in the talk, I want to just connect security concerns to evaluations of public security institutions. For the uh, first time in, 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 in 2014, we asked a number of questions, a number of additional questions about satisfaction with local police. So we asked this question, in general, are you very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied with the performance of the police in your neighborhood? And if the respondent just offered without us asking, you know, there are no police, um, we, we marked that as very dissatisfied. Um, this is something that we saw come across in our pre-testing, and so what we did was we had instructions for the interviewer to go ahead and, and mark that. And we, so we knew to anticipate it because in going out and doing the pre-test, we had heard people offer that response. What we see on average is that there's almost an even split, just about 50% to 50% of people who are satisfied, some degree of satisfied, or some degree of dissatisfied with local police performance. This level of satisfaction varies significantly across countries. Here you're seeing mean values on a zero to 100 satisfaction with police performance scale. So what you can see is that in Canada and the US, mean values in terms of satisfaction with local police performance are significantly higher than what we find in some other uh, countries. And in particular, we see countries such as Haiti, Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia, Mexico, down at the bottom of the rankings in terms of satisfaction with local police performance. When we look at individual predictors of of this of, of this uh, attitude, this this evaluation of local police, we find that greater insecurity is linked to it. So that those who feel more insecure have uh, report more dissatisfaction, and we can think of that in the other way as well. The more dissatisfied you are with local police performance, the more insecure you're likely to feel. These two two things feed each other. Okay. What else fuels discontent with the police? We asked, I think, what I think it's a really interesting question in 2014 about uh, perceived response times. So the question asks, and I'd like you all to sort of do a little thought experiment, think this through for yourselves. Suppose someone enters your home to burglarize it, and you call the police. How long do you think it would take the police to arrive at your house on a typical day around noon? So you should be asking yourself two questions, right? One is, how long do you think it would take the police to, to arrive at your house? And the second question is, what's acceptable, right? So maybe, maybe sort of combining those, I, I'd sort of say, well, I, I hope that the police would come, you know, lightning fast. You know, um, I, I, I'm going to tell you that from my neighborhood, I've seen it. I've seen them come um, in response to a burglary. It, it was about three minutes. Uh, what's acceptable? Let me give them a little bit of a, a cushion there. I'll say under 10 minutes, right? Across the Americas, on average, 12% of our respondents say less than 10 minutes. Right? The remainder all say more. 
a small sliver of them, 9%, say there are no police. Police never come. You know, there's no, not, no point in calling anyone. Right. Um, on uh, the majority of, re of respondents indicate that the typical response time is more than more than 30 minutes. That estimate of police response time, as you would expect, is strongly related to dissatisfaction with the police. So the longer you think that it takes the police to respond, the more dissatisfied you are with local performance. Right? Then there's a question of what predicts reports of, 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 of sort of estimated response time. And here we have uh, the results of a multiple variable regression analysis. So uh, you can see the headline there, but I want to just walk you through it uh, quickly. What well, we're showing you are standardized regression coefficients from an analysis in which we include for those students in the room country fixed effects. We're not showing you those here, but we're hold, holding that uh, constant. We're controlling for, for those differences. And we're putting into the analysis these independent variables that you see going down the y-axis. Okay? Each of these dots is a standardized regression coefficient. The wings are the confidence interval around that. Okay? If the dot does not overlap with the zero line, we consider that to be a statistically significant effect. If it's over here, it's a negative relationship. If it's over here, it's a positive relationship. So let me now just point out what you're already reading, which is that even when we control for urban rural residents, for years of schooling, for wealth, we see a positive and statistically significant relationship between skin tone, the, the respondent skin tone, which is recorded by the interviewer at the end of the interview discreetly. The interviewer also records their own facial skin tone. And even when we, when we control for everything else, we see that those with darker skin tones are reporting longer res re police response times. We also see, so, see as some things that you would expect, which is that in um, urban areas, we have a negative relationship, so lower, lower or quicker response times reported. Interestingly enough, women report longer police response times, so they either perceive or they experience or both that the police are not as responsive to their calls. Um, and we see some effects there for, for, for years of schooling, wealth, uh, and, edu uh, and age. Moving out from our uh, a focus on the local police, I want to just uh, briefly touch on something that we see in the report with respect to trust in so, br national institutions related to the provision of law enforcement. On average, across the, the region throughout the period that we've been uh, conducting the America's Barometers survey, we see a downward trend, and that, that downward dip is particularly steep on a couple of these indicators between 2012 and 2014. So here what you're seeing are uh, mean values on our trust in the national police indicator, our trust in the justice system indicator, and trust in the courts. And in each of these, in particular, the last two dropped significantly between 2012 and 2014. In the report, we connect these uh, back to issues of crime and insecurity. I'm going to um, do a little bit of that here, and what I've done is I've created a composite variable based on those three indicators, uh, and I'm looking at the relationship here between perceptions of insecurity and confidence in the rule of law. And what we see is is that the the more insecure you are, the lower the level of, of trust you have in these institutions. And again, I think this is a relationship where these variables are, are feeding each other, right? What about citizens' preferences over how to deal with these issues of crime and insecurity? One of the things that we see and we talk about in the report is a relationship between insecurity and preferences for vigilante justice, for taking the law into your own hands, and for more punitive policy solutions. So let me just give you a, a sense of that. On average, for the region, support for taking the law into your own hands, or as we might we call it sometimes vigilante justice, hovers around 30 units on a 0 to 100 scale. So these, again, are mean values on a 0 to 100 scale. You're seeing that they're around 30. That's not particularly high, although, as was pointed out um, earlier this week when we were uh, talking to some individuals about these, these findings, you know, when you think of how you sort of what's acceptable in, in, in terms of support for taking the law into your own hands, you probably do want a lower, lower value. What we see, though, in the data is that between 2012 and 2014, there was an uptick. 
Okay, so 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 it's hovering around the same values, but in the last period, trended upward. When we look at preferences over over uh, policies to to prevent crime, what we see is that between 2012 and 2014, preferences for more punitive measures increased. So here in 2012, about 40 well about 47 percent of the individuals on average across the region region expressed a preference for punitive measures, and that increased to 55.1 percent in 2014. Each of these connects back to insecurity, uh, so that those who are more insecure report higher levels of preferences for vigilante justice. When we divide up the, 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 the respondents into those who prefer more pre preventative measures versus more punitive measures, those who are more punitive are those who are more insecure. And I'm going to now turn it over to Matt to talk about corruption. Thank you, Liz. And I also want to just join, take a second and thank our hosts here at the Latin American and got to get the title right, Caribbean Center. I knew it was LAC. I had to get both C's um, for this gracious invitation and this wonderful event and for their sub ongoing support of this initiative. It's really useful. So what I'm going to be presenting today is um, the data from the second half of the report, just a small subset of it. There's so many things that we are able to look at with this data. As Mitch said, there's so many topics we can't even touch. And even within the report, you know, we can only talk about so many things. So I'm going to talk about corruption today. And this is work done with my colleagues, um, Greg Love and Ryan Carlin, who will be presenting this afternoon as well. And so we're going to focus on corruption. And the big theme I want to hit is that this is a massive problem that is not moving. It's incredibly sticky. And as Mitch mentioned, this is one of these issues that we've always thought the development and institution building that Chris was talking about should be able to get rid of. And we've heard all this lip service towards improving governance. And the data just shows that it's just sticky in survey after survey, the number of people who report being victimized and the amount of corruption that they perceive among public officials in their countries within the hemisphere just doesn't move a lot. And so it's gonna be not a lot of happy news in what we're gonna talk about for the next little bit. So yeah, so like I said, we'll start with reported levels of corruption. In the America's Barometer, we ask about a series of questions asking about how often people are targeted and asked to pay a bribe. And we do this in a variety of settings. So um, start with just a couple of the interactions that lots of people have with you know, police officers, government employees, in the countries where it's relevant, um, having a soldier, a military officer. And so these questions are asked of everybody. And there's a as this battery continues, they then go through and screen and ask about various interactions, both with public officials and general societal actors, you know, in the workplace and schools and healthcare. And in each of these second batteries, there's a screening question asking, okay, do you work? And if you work, then did you have to pay a bribe? Were you asked to pay a bribe, excuse me, at work? And, you know, similarly in school and in other settings. And we can then look at these data and break it down. So I have two different versions of the questions here. So the chart here on the left looks at just on average across the population, what percentage of people were asked to pay a bribe in each setting? So for example, on average in an average country, 10% of respondents said, I was asked by a police officer to pay a bribe. One in 10. And so that's the highest, and you go down government employee, five, asked to pay a bribe at four, at school, four, all the way down to courts, where it's only one and a half percent. But that's within the entire population. Most people don't deal with the court in any given year. And so when we then, in the second column, this is the data that takes advantage of, okay, once we've asked you, did you have an interaction with this actor? Were you asked to pay a bribe? And so, for example, courts, only one and a half percent of the population reports paying a bribe to the court. Among those who are in court, it's 14 percent on average across the hemisphere. Now, that's not even the highest. Um, if you had to process documents of the municipal government, we're also hanging out at 14 percent. Um, you know, similarly, like, you know, again, among those who had to pay a bribe at school, 10 percent of those individuals that had an interaction with a school institution report they were asked to pay a bribe. And so it's just common in so many areas of life with public officials, with non-public officials and other areas. 
And so when you add it all up, and we just sort of do a summary measure of, okay, across all these settings, did you have to, were you asked to pay a bribe at least once? At least one bribe in at least one of these settings, roughly one in five. In an average country throughout the hemisphere, we're asked to pay at least one bribe in the 12 months before the survey. One out of five. Now, obviously, some people are being asked to pay more than that, but it's just so common when it's one out of five. And when we look at it over time, like um, we said, this hardly moves. So if we go back to 2006, 20%, 19%, essentially 18%, 20%, 19%. With the exception of 2010, all those confidence intervals, the gray bars at the top, all overlap. Which basically just means this is not changing at all. There is no trend. As the economy has been getting better in objective measures and household wealth has been getting better, corruption isn't in terms of the day-to-day -day being asked to pay a bribe on average in the hemisphere. It's just staying. Now, obviously, there's also quite a bit of variance across countries. So there's the hemisphere, and then there's Haiti. <laughs> I mean, you know, Haiti, it's 70% of respondents say they were asked to pay a bribe. And when you look at each of the forms, uh, which you're pretty much any place where you can imagine people have common interactions, you know, not just with public officials, <laughs> with your employer, with education, with healthcare, you're being asked for bribes. Um, you know, so once you then go there, you know, then with the rest of the hemisphere, you know, Bolivia at 30%, Paraguay 28, Mexico 27, Venezuela 26, down towards the bottom, the United States, Uruguay, you know, Chile and Canada all at 8% or less. So there's substantial variation within the hemisphere. And then, of course, there's also variation in some of these countries over time. Um, Bolivia's 30% is lower than it was in 2012. Ecuador's 26% is lower than it was in 2012. Venezuela's seen an uptick. Panama's seen an uptick. Belize has seen an uptick. And so there are, there are some changes, but it doesn't, on average, it doesn't change a whole lot. And so the question then becomes, who's being asked to pay a bribe? Who's being targeted? And one of the things you see in this is that it's very often, so this again, so there's regression coefficients, positive, you're more likely to be asked to pay a bribe, negative, you're less likely. So on average, it's people who are in rural areas who are not being asked. It's people who are poor who are not being asked. It's women who are not being asked. And so in each of these scenarios, a lot of this what attracts is who's having interactions with officials who might ask them for a bribe. So, for example, if we look just at um, education and healthcare, men and women are actually asked for bribes at roughly equal rates, because that's the only set of these institutions where men and women interact at the same levels and are, have the equal opportunity to be asked. Um, but yeah, so we see this that it's the individuals who are, have these opportunities to be interacted with that are then having to be asked to pay a bribe. So on that, there's a question that asks, so did you receive you know, assistance from the government from the last year? And they ask about various programs, um, social programs, et cetera. And individuals who are receiving government benefits are more likely to report having been asked to pay a bribe in the last um, 12 months. Now, the questions don't ask, allow us to then connect the dots and say that those two events are equal. We're just gonna put it there as a symptom. And, um, you know, note that at the very least, we can surmise that these individuals are having higher levels of interaction with these government officials. Then the last one, again, this, there are things we can do that are symptoms without being able to fully diagnose them with survey data. So this is from the battery of questions that Liz presented on the types of crime that you perceived in your neighborhood. Um, and it's an additive index of those four crimes, burglary, um, extortion, murder, and... What's the other one? Drugs. Drugs. There we go. And so we could do the same thing, though, if I just looked at how safe do you feel in your neighborhood. You see the exact same pattern you see here, where individuals who report living in high crime areas are also more likely to report that they're being asked to pay bribes. Now, we don't, again, don't know what's causing what here. Is it that these two problems have the same root cause? Or is one of them causing the other? Again, the survey data can't let us know that. 
But as we're talking about the depths of insecurity in the region, and we're talking about the depths of corruption in the region, this data suggests that at the individual level, these are connected, that the same people are experiencing both. And just sort of these problems have become additive at the individual level. So those are the personal experiences of being asked to pay a bribe. Now, obviously, not everyone has it happen to you, but you can still hear about it. Also, there's all kinds of corruption scandals that don't involve the ordinary respondents, where you can see the scandal happening at the national level. So the America's Barometer also asks a question about how common is corruption among public officials? And so the specific question wording is you know, taking into account your own experience or what you've heard. How common is corruption? And what you can see is that almost 80% of people say it's at least common. Now, the 80% is roughly equally split between those that say it's very common or common. And again, 80% is a lot. I, I'm, I'm not very good with numbers. I can get that one. 80% um, of people think that probably, you know, corruption is common is a lot. And so when we see that, again, it's not moving. We can then look at it over time. So this time. is taking that question and turning it into a 100-point scale. And it's just flat. I mean, compare, I love that 2012, that average score was 71.6. In 2014, it's 71.61. It's not changing. Uh, you know, despite changes in who's in charge, how the economy is doing, just the average perception of corruption in the region is that it's rampant and widespread. Again, it varies by country. And here we don't see the same big gaps. So if you actually look at the data, I mean, so Venezuela comes in at the highest at 80%, with Colombia right behind it at 79.6, Argentina at 79. These gray bars are the confidence intervals in um, you know, the survey error that you know, comes into account as you are designing a survey. And so as they overlap, essentially all of these countries up here are in a statistical tie for citizens there to say, look, corruption's really rampant. Then you can break it down to those where it's less common. And it's also worth noting that there's not a perfect relationship between the countries where individuals report paying or being asked to pay lots of bribes and where they report that you know, public officials are very corrupt. Don't believe me? Look at Haiti. So in Haiti, everyone's being asked to pay bribes, and yet they're not at the hemisphere lead for saying that you know, corruption is rampant among public officials, though still most people say it's common. And so we can, even if we exclude Haiti, that's such an outlier. If we look at the data, what you can see is on average, we can see the sort of group in the middle where there's countries you know, that have lots of both, where people here are reporting being asked to pay a bribe and also perceive that corruption among public officials is widespread. There's countries that where most respondents are doing neither. And then what you see is that our countries that are kind of off the diagonal. So Bolivia is an interesting case, where in Bolivia, the number of people who report being asked to pay a bribe is really high. And yet, in comparative perspective, the number of people who say their government's corrupt is, you know, right around, the, slightly below the hemisphere average. You can go in contrast to, uh, you know, Colombia or Jamaica or Argentina or Guyana, where respondents are not reporting that being asked for bribes is occurring as frequently, but yet they're very much in belief that their government is corrupt. Again, the data doesn't really allow us to really tap into this and to say what's driving this difference. Is it national level scandals? Is it the fact that you know, certain presidents have wide bases of public support that leads to people not wanting to say they're corrupt? Um, but there are these exceptions where it can occur. At the individual level, however, when we say what factors lead people to say that the government is um, more corrupt, individuals who are asked to pay a bribe, sorry, not the government, public officials, excuse me, um, I want to get the question word right, um, public officials are more likely to be perceived as corrupt by people who are asked to pay a bribe. What I want to hit for this presentation is just that box, that, that finding that's in the box. Again, individuals who live in areas where crime is common and where they perceive it to be common are more likely to report that public officials in their country are very corrupt. Those things are just clustering together and are an additive issue. And so when we look at these issues, corruption 
has negative consequences for other attitudes. So uh, Mitch is going to present some of this when we talk about democratic attitudes. I'm going to take this brief second to advertise um, a couple of other chapters from the report that we're not talking about here. So um, as we talked about, so the economy, views of the economy are incredibly pessimistic in Latin America in 2014. Um, that data that Chris presented is reflected in public opinion. Um, attitudes towards the economy at their, are at their most negative that we've seen in, since the America's barometer started. And individuals who live in high crime areas and who report being asked to pay a bribe are more negative about how the economy is doing, even after controlling for how the economy is doing. Um, similarly, when we ask how much do you trust municipal government, which is also declining, that's what we found in 2014, perceptions of insecurity and corruption victimization are associated with people being less trusting of municipal governments in the hemisphere. And so we see that again and again, that these failures of governance are having these negative consequences. So the last thing I wanted to mention is, so given this, we might worry that people become accustomed to corruption. I start to say, it's just the cost of doing business. So the America's Brahminer has this question, given the things, the way things are, sometimes paying a bribe is justified, yes or no. And good news, this is one of these times where, I'm gonna, you know, where I look at a graph and say, glass half full, only time I'm going to do that, is 83% um, of respondents say no. That paying a bribe should not be justified. Now, if we look at individuals who are asked to pay a bribe, that number is higher. And we can go beyond that. Um, if you look at one of the insight reports that was distributed last year by my colleague, Ryan Carlin, um, countries in which bribery justification is more widespread, I'm mean, sorry, where bribery experiences are more widespread or where the support for the rule of law is weaker, also tend to have larger populations that say paying a bribe is justified. So there is some kind of trickle down here where the corruption does have this impact of being associated with at least more willingness to say it can be justified. But even among people who are asked to pay a bribe, 70% say that shouldn't be justified. That's not how it should be. And so, again, as we see these negative trends and we see that corruption and insecurity and these other things are having these negative impacts on attitudes towards the system, this glass that's half empty, half full, depending on how you see it, for me is reassuring. I don't want people to think it should be justified. Given the pervasiveness of the problem of insecurity that Liz presented and the pervasiveness of the problem of corruption that this data shows, I don't want people to be happy. I want them to be holding politicians accountable. And I'm hoping that's part of what we see in the data, even as that doesn't mean that we can have concerns about how they're evaluating the institutions in their country, which is the third theme that we'll um, be talking about. But I want to move the camera lens back a little bit to deal with the overall subject, which is democracy. After all, all these are just components of the overall democratic issue. And so let me take us back to where we began in these surveys way, way back into the 1970s, where we tried to figure out something about democracy. Um, and what we see here is that there is a strong belief in democracy, but there are a lot of fragilities when we get down below the general notion about democracy is the best system. Um, this question, the so-called Churchill question, changing the subject again, we ask people, democracy may have many problems, but it's better than any other form of government. To what extent do you agree with that? Well, it's pretty clear that there's very little change here. Overwhelmingly, we have people saying that it's the best game in town. However, what we mean by democracy differs a lot. Many of you in your graduate seminars probably have 15 students in the class and 15 definitions of democracy. I recall during the Pinochet regime, I went to Chile and people were saying, this is the strongest democracy in the Americas. And I was saying, I hear that again? Um, so you get very different definitions. So getting below that, we for many years developed a measure that actually we developed first in Germany uh, in the days of the Red Brigades when we were trying to look at um, student dissent and student violent protest, and we ported it over to Costa Rica in the uh, late 1970s and have been using it ever since, which are two different measures of democracy. On the one hand, legitimacy. Do people believe that the system has the right to rule? Are you willing at that level to say that, for example, to what extent do you think the courts guarantee a fair trial? To what extent do you have 
respect for the political institutions, to what extent do you feel proud to live under the system? A series of items, five items, that we've measured on a scale of one to seven for many, many years, and we sum up into an overall system support measure. But the flip side of that is that I may think the system has the right to rule, but I don't like anyone else having any rights, okay, any civil liberties. And we, would, and we ask a series of questions. There are people who only say bad things in this country. Should they have the right to vote, to run for office, to speak out, and so on? Basic civil liberties, pretty core things, support for the system and tolerance. And we put those together into a pretty simple two-by-two two scheme. We have on the, on the vertical axis system support broken down simply by high and low. And we take all the people in the country, in this case in the, in, the, in the merged data set, and we take a look at all those people who are on the high side versus those who are on the low side. And then we look at political tolerance, people who are tolerant versus those who are intolerant. And what we would like to see in a country which has a civic culture supportive of democracy, we'd like to see lots of people over here, people who are both believing that this country has a government that has the right to rule, and are also are willing to tolerate dissent, willing to tolerate the rights of others. What we worry about is this cell over here, democracy at risk. I don't like the system, and I don't like anyone else's rights to complain about it, okay? That is a complete rejection of two core norms, way beyond democracy is the best system, okay? Which is easy to agree with. But agreeing with both of those, I, I support the system, but I also am willing to tolerate your right to run for office or vote or whatever. When we put those together, we um, have found that it is a canary in the coal mine in that in our work in, in Central America, we found that prior to the coup in Honduras that took place in 2009, we saw catastrophic levels of democracy at risk. Now, we weren't able to predict the coup. What we were predicting, what we were explaining is that there was a an, an attitudinal basis in which elites were playing their games. In this case, the military coming in and the courts and so on, removing the president in his pajamas and sending him to Costa Rica. Um, uh, we, these are permissive environments in which things like coups can go on. Okay, we just had a piece that, uh, about Guyana, the closing of the parliament in Guyana and what's going on in terms of system support in that country. So we try to use this as some kind of a measure to say where are things headed, a leading indicator, as it will, of democratic stability. And the not so good news is that if you look at where this overall measure, these are the individual items, the overall measure of system support, it's headed in a downward trend. Okay, so we're not getting very far in terms of system support going up, rather it's heading in a negative way. When we look at the contrasts, and a lot of our report in 2014 now uses this mapping, you'll see it in the report, we see the dramatic contrast between, on the one hand, Costa Rica, which scores at the top, and interestingly enough, Brazil, where we got the largest populations, scoring at the bottom on system support. Let me turn to the impact of this in terms of neighbor and security. Here are these items on predicting uh, system support, okay? What do we see on the, on the bottom? These are all the standard control measures, age, urban, rural, and so on. Yes, presidential job approval matters a lot. It's way over there, okay? The president has a big impact on these items. But other things really matter. Neighborhood insecurity erodes support for the system. Corruption victimization erodes support for the system. And of course, if the economy is doing well, people have a higher support for the system. They're no surprises. But in terms of the two themes my colleagues talked about, insecurity and corruption, they tend to undermine, erode support for the system. Now let's turn to political tolerance. These four items that I mentioned a moment ago with the deal with really basic civil liberties. And we see is the extreme contrast between Canada on the one hand, at the top of the system, with the greatest levels of tolerance, and Guatemala, on the other hand, with the lowest levels of tolerance. Basically, what we look at, though, in terms of the trends, we see declines in tolerance. So I already told you we have declines in system support, and now we have declines in tolerance that are going on in the Americas, accompanied with this leveling off and stagnation and decline that Chris mentioned in the beginning in terms of where the economies are going. Not a particularly, uh, you know, optimistic picture, and I'm sorry to, to, to you know, end on that kind of note for our, our, our findings. Um, what are the overall trends in this matrix? Let me just show you where we are. 
stable democracy comparing 2012 and 2014 has declined from about 28 percent of the population of the americas that had that combination of attitudes that we'd like to see i'd love to see 50 percent in there 60 percent but it's a quarter and declining and when we look at the democracy at risk just the opposite trend going from 23 percent not a dramatic increase but up to 28 percent so the trends of those two variables working in opposite directions Again, looking at these contrasts, Canada and Guatemala are at the two extremes on that cell. To go back here for a moment, we're just looking at the stable democracy cell. Canada and Guatemala are two extremes. We're not expecting a coup or a breakdown in, 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 in Canada anytime soon, and we're not predicting a breakdown in Guatemala. But certainly, you're at the opposite extremes in these cases. And at best, most countries just have sort of middling levels of support for those two key norms. People support democracy in the abstract. When it comes to the particulars, they have a lot of problems with it. Um, that's the summary. I'll leave it on the screen, I suppose. Or, or would, uh, you, would you want to take it back, Liz? Yeah. And we let these guys hack away at us. And okay. Well, I want to say that uh, um, I've known Mitch Seligson for for very, very long, and. Uh, uh, not quite as long as Mark Rosenberg, but uh, mm -hmm. but I've known Mitch for for many years, and we were uh, I missed him at Pitt. We 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 didn't quite overlap, but uh, uh, but I do want to say uh, how proud I am to uh, uh, to be able to share this uh, this uh, uh, this panel today. Uh, but I'm even more proud that uh, that Frank has managed finally to somehow you know bring them onto the FIU uh, lack. Uh, uh, consortium of sorts. And um, the data here is, is just really absolutely invaluable. And uh, every year that passes, of course, uh, um, the first time I, I saw Mitch doing some of this stuff, he was we were in Central America in 1987 at a seminar um, in, in Costa Rica, as a matter of fact, when he was trying to convince all Latin Americans how we should all adopt this kind of methodology. And of course, nobody was really paying much attention to him at the time, and uh, uh, because we we were a, a lot more into theory and things of that kind, and uh, um, and here we are, you know, almost 30 years later, and uh, um, and the wealth of, of information, and you know, just the absolute uh, um, uh, access that people have to this, of course, is something else that I think is is really important to note. Uh, most of us who do public opinion polling, and I, I've now been doing it for the better part of the last 15 years in the region, we don't really share data, okay, uh, as much as as much as Mitch and his team does. And I think that this is really the most extraordinary value of this of of this uh, of this approach. It's valuable to our students, it's valuable to other researchers, and it's certainly value valuable to policymakers. So. So having said those very nice things about about your poll, let me uh, let me move into uh, <laughs> uh, it. You know, it is quite difficult to do the, these kinds of projects, and especially because you know these are these are so detailed in terms of methodology that uh, they can do things, they can afford to do things that other pollsters can't. Especially pollsters like myself who poll for political parties or political candidates and the like. We don't have the privilege of being able first to have a large access to to uh, to the kind of funding, but also we don't have the benefit of time. And so time trying to get data out in a in a very quick uh, 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 turnaround time is is uh, is really is really complicated. But but here's what what's interesting, and I'm going to uh, just limit my my comments uh, really to. To, to Elizabeth's uh, uh, presentation. Let me say uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I've been working in, uh, in the Caribbean for, for a long time now, and uh, uh, sort of as a, as a practitioner in many ways, and uh, um, the data here really bears true to, to most of what I've seen, especially in terms of how victimization drives perception of insecurity. I mean, that's, that's absolutely, uh, absolutely clear. But what's, what's interesting is when you start looking at the nature of the crime, and, and, uh, and here in terms of how it affects policy, I know there's a lot of people here that are interested in, in specific policy, policy things. In, uh, in 2004, we, uh, um, uh, we worked with, with uh, President Fernandez in the Dominican Republic in designing a, a national security, uh, basically a citizen security program. Um, and uh, we decided to focus first and foremost on violent deaths, all right? And uh, 
because we decided that the nature of the crime is really what affected, you know, the perception of insecurity. And so it was quite quite common to see, for example, that uh, that uh, you know, uh, with a with a death per hundred thousand rate of twenty seven. Uh, that uh, that this you know in fact drove a lot of media coverage and so on and spectacular killings and the like. So we designed a policy that basically targeted um, uh, violent deaths. And uh, what we did is we targeted especially uh, deaths that were being carried out by the police, because in fact it was violent deaths that you know the police was explaining them as the the the, the um, uh, um, uh, intercambio de disparos, you know, and it was an exchange of gunfire. But of course, we knew that sometimes, you know, they would they would kill people in one neighborhood and they would appear in the other, and they would appear with you know shots in the back of the head. But it was still an intercambio de disparos. Well, what we did, however, in two years, just by focusing on police murders, we dropped the rate of of, uh, of violent deaths uh, dramatically. All right. Now, at the same time, however, as we did that, what was striking is how the rate of burglaries and home invasions and so on shot up. And of course, when you talk to the police, the police would tell you, well, this is, this is very logical. You know, uh, the people no longer fear the police because they know that if the, the police is going to be, you know, punished for this. And so, you know, uh, they know that if they're going to be caught, they're not going to be shot. So basically what the police was lobbying for was this, was this, you know, let's focus more on burglaries and let's forget a little bit about, uh, about uh, the violent deaths. To make a long story short, I lost the debate and the Dominican Republic after 2008 went back to a focus on reducing burglaries and home invasions because that is what the perception was driven by. Perception of insecurity at the time was driven. So I think what you've done here is really kind of pinpoint that, but it has a dramatic impact on how policymakers ha have to deal with this. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you when you look at uh, the evaluation of public uh, security institutions, and, and th this to me is really also uh, very close to, 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 to my heart right now because I've been working in Haiti for the better part of the last three years. And your data is really quite striking about Haiti because Haiti, yes, at the local level, there seems to be dissatisfaction with the police, but uh, Haiti has one of the highest rates in, in some of your other tables of, uh, of, of trust in the police. All right. It really is quite amazing that that, you know, uh, so, you know, that contrast, I'm not I'm not quite sure how 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 that happens. And this is in, in my own polls. We, we you know, it's around 50 percent trust for the Haitian National Police. Now, if you go to the local level, right uh, outside of Port-au-Prince in particular, what you're going to find is that there's no police presence. Right. And there's a little bit of Minusta and Minusta has, by the way, when you ask about the presence of Minusta, which is really the main law enforcement institution in Haiti, uh, nobody likes Minusta. All right. Absolutely nobody likes Minusta. Uh, now, um, in terms of police response times also, and, and especially, again, when you look at it from the perspective of, of trying to to uh, to design some kind of policies aimed at improving citizen security. Look, uh, when we first started in the Dominican Republic, uh, uh, we tried calling the police to find out what the response time was. And what we got was that the police, uh, the police station's uh, number had been disconnected. And uh, we found out that it had been disconnected for lack of payment. So the telephone company disconnected the phone because they hadn't paid. All right. But what the Dominican Republic now has is a 911 system. All right. And the most recent evaluation of the 911 system, which started about three, three or four months ago, is that, and this is again, it's a real important cultural transformation. Uh, they have now, you know, they're saturated with phone calls. Most of them are people calling and pranking. All right. So, so, so again, it's a, it's an important transformation. Unless you can punish people for pranking on the 911, you know, you're not going to be able to transform. Uh, uh, you have a 911 system, but it really, it really doesn't work. So the response time does have an impact on how people perceive the police. Now, there's one additional element. When we did some of these interviews uh, uh, and, and focus groups and so on, and we asked, well, you know, when the police comes to your, uh, how, how long does it take it to come? Well, you know, maybe half an hour, or an hour. Sometimes they don't show up. But you know what? Frankly, we prefer for them not to show up 
because when they show up, they finish victimizing us. All right. Not only do they give, you know, do they ask us for bribes, but sometimes they themselves steal what the what the what the burglars didn't steal. All right. So so there's a whole series of very complex issues re related to how perception is is formed. Now. Uh, let me move very quickly because I know you told me only 10 minutes and I don't know how many minutes I've already gone. But uh, let me go Let me go to, to the corruption issue. And, and I'm always reminded, my students get tired of me quoting Huntington on this, but I'm always reminded of, of Huntington's uh, uh, one, uh, you know, statement which he said, you know, he asked, who's out of, out of place? The guy who storms the police department and, uh, you know, denouncing corruption or the guy who pays the bribe and simply moves on, okay? And Huntington basically concluded that who was out of place was the guy who stormed the police station, all right? And what you seem to be saying is that Huntington now would be wrong in the Americas, all right? That, that in fact, what we're seeing is, uh, is uh, you know, um, this intolerance of, of, of people paying, uh, paying bribes, that paying bribes is not something that, uh, that uh, people see anymore with, uh, with any kind of, uh, you know, uh, favoritism, right? Um, but, but you know what's interesting about about your your observation uh, is is the following that, um, uh, in fact, TI just came out with its index this morning, and uh, you know again Latin America is way down there in, in, in terms of of the corruption perception. But here's what's interesting that when you think about uh, uh, the impact on the political system, and I think you know again, Mitch, you're absolutely correct. I think you know this incidence of corruption. Uh, has an impact on how on on system support. People are getting tired of of paying of paying these bribes, and they don't support the system, and so on. But you know, here's a couple of, of very interesting things. When you look, when you ask people at the bottom, uh, you know, have you paid a bribe? And especially again in focus groups, more so than on the quantitative kind of questions. When you ask them, you know, well, do you pay bribes? Yes, of course we pay bribes because otherwise we don't get we don't get what we need to get. But and, and you say, well, what do you think of that? He says, you know what? I really don't mind paying that bribe, right? Which bribe do you mind paying? Which are the ones that you really feel bad about? And they are the large scale corruption. So, for example, again, let me pick on the Dominican Republic for, for a moment. In the Dominican Republic, you know, and, and I have to look more at your data and see what, what the individual level responses are. But, you know, what we found is that People were very tolerant of the kind of bribery that is done to get to get a bureaucratic procedure uh, completed, for example. But the level of intolerance that today is being manifested is for the very, very large scale corruption of, of, of some government officials, especially construction contractors and the like. And that's being demonstrated not only in terms of, of, uh, of how you measure this in, in, a, in, a, in a poll, but it's also being uh, uh, measured by activism on social media, on the streets. And, but what we're not seeing it, and this is what's, what's quite striking, I just finished a, a, a poll there for, for, for somebody, and what we found is really quite interesting. A politician who is most associated with corruption, uh, Don El Fernandez, okay, uh, also has the highest rate of popular support. All right. And so you have this very interesting contrast. You know, you ask them, well, who is most associated with corruption? And they'll say Leonel Fernandez. And then, and then you say, well, but who will you vote for? Leonel Fernandez. All right. So, and what we're seeing across, you know, and so maybe Huntington is not that, that, that wrong still. You know, I, I think that, you know, in many ways, what people are seeing is to get things done, it sort of goes back to this old statement that, that the Cubans always make, you know, el tiburón baña pero salpica, right? And, and that is, you know, that it's this, this, this impression that, you know, people, uh, these guys may be corrupt, but you know what? There's el elevado, there's the tunnel, there's this, there's that. We don't really, yes, we're, you know, darn, they're corrupt. You know, I wish they weren't corrupt, but look all that have they, they have done to develop our countries. All right. And, but the more troubling one for me, of course, is, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat of a, of a, of a skeptic of, a, of, a, of the, of the success that Evo Morales has been having in Bolivia, for example, you know, I mean, you know, and, and this is where I think Mitch was touching on this and all, and, and all of you were touching on this as well. Look, uh, in Bolivia, you, your results show that when you ask people, are you, are you paying bribes? And they're saying, yes, of course we're paying bribes. But then, you know, when you get to the higher level question about, you know, well, is the government corrupt, basically, most people are saying, not really. Okay. 
And so I think part of the problem with this, with the general scores that you have is that you're not really looking into regime type to a certain extent. And I think it really does make a difference. You know, uh, in, in, in the case of Bolivia, for example, Evo is so popular that his margin of error is lo a lot larger than, the, than, the, than, than your margin of error. All right. You know, people just give him people have an awful lot of tolerance for Evo Morales's mistakes. All right. They 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 will will tolerate corruption. They'll tolerate authoritarianism. They'll tolerate human rights violations uh, simply because he has this extraordinary level of, of, of popular support. And uh, I was going to say one more thing, because I think my 10 minutes are, are up. Uh, and, it, and it has to do with this with this issue of of uh, um of uh, what uh, I think is happening in the region more generally, and, and this is, uh, it, it really couples with, uh, with what your data shows, that there is, you know, somewhat of declining regime support or system support, really, more than anything else. But what we're finding, and, and this is interesting, is that, you know, there really is a gap, a measurable gap, between what politicians promise and what they deliver. And we're measuring this increasingly now, you know, there's citizens really, really are upset about people running on a particular platform, getting into office and then changing whatever it is that they promised. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of what, what politicians do when they run is they'll, they'll promise, you know, the new elevado, the new this, the new, all, all of the, all of the, particularly in terms of social policy, the delivery is very, very minimal. All right. Um, but again, what, what, it, what it really points to, however, is that those countries where the delivery on those specific promises is greatest just happens to be in those countries that are a little bit more populous than, than others. All right? so, so delivery, for example, is much higher in Bolivia than it is in, in countries that are more along the neoliberal spectrum. You know, and I, again, I, I think we're, we're, we're finding that, that the democratic deficit that, uh, that Nora, uh, P that uh, uh, Pippin talks about for the Americans and for the Europeans, in some measure we're seeing this, this gap growing in Latin America at a much quicker pace. Uh, and what we're seeing is that those countries that deliver are those that do not necessarily have, you know, those minimal criterion for uh, at least the uh, representative democracy norms that most of your scale measures, all right? For example, there's no real concern about freedom of expression in the traditional liberal democracy sense, all right? Uh, shutting down newspapers by changing the rules, for example, is, is, a, is a nice way of, of, of saying, yes, we respect freedom of, of expression, but, you know, in essence, we've changed the rules of the game so that certain people can't own, can't, can't own uh, uh, media. Uh, and, um, and, and certainly, you know, uh, yes, we tolerate the opposition. The opposition can run for office, but, you know, we're also going to jail anybody who's accused of corruption, by the way. Corruption has become a fantastic mechanism to to wipe out the political opposition. And so there's this phenomenon that, that uh, you know, is democratic in a way because, you know, what, what, uh, what people like Evo Morales and other governments have done is to judicialize politics, right? So if you decide you're, you're a political candidate, the first thing you have to fend off is accusations of corruption. So, so I think, you know, your, your, your final words there were, you know, I, I want you know, people to be more concerned about this, and I'd like this for, for this to be different. But the way it's being used is also, you know, I think, um, you know, yes, we're, we're jailing more people for corruption, but uh, not necessarily is everybody who's corrupt going to jail. And it really depends on who's holding the, you know, the, 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 key, to the, the key to the jail, frankly. All right, so, so with those general ideas, let me, let me step down. Thank you. Okay, Greg. So like everyone else, I want to um, thank you for the invitation to come. Uh, the LAPOP data is uh, really incredible, not only for research purposes, but also for pedagogical purposes. So I use it in class all the time. Um, 
because you can show very clearly, okay, here's what's going on in certain countries. You can do it comparatively. You can do it in single countries. Um, and so it's just, it's an incredible tool, um, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, what I'm going to focus on, and I'm glad, by the way, as I'm grateful to Eduardo, as I'm the second discussant, that what I'm going to discuss is totally different from his, so I didn't end up copying him. Um, but uh, I want to kind of pull back and think about, okay, well, what does this data tell us, but also um, what does this data not tell us? And uh, so I have two separate kind of themes. Um, one is that as people were talking, I was writing down variables and then putting arrows all over the place. And so I think, and this is also not a, it's not a criticism of the data per se, because um, it's a certain sense, it's like reviewers asking you to, reviewing a work and saying, would you have done something, please do something completely different the way I want you to do it. Um, but to say, okay, well, what's causing what? We can look at these as independent variables and we can look at them as dependent variables. And honestly, when you look at them either way, it's a really surprisingly depressing picture. Uh, and uh, though some of the things that Eduardo said, I think are, are spot on about, you know, people might perceive corruption, but certain types of corruption are really going to bother them more. It may well be that it's only a small percent of it that really gets people to, um, say, distrust government more. But, you know, for the past 10 years, we look at this longitudinally, um, supposedly good things were happening in Latin America. So we're seeing democratization. You know, every time you have articles, well, all countries are electoral democracies except Cuba. And so that's a good thing. Um, we are looking at perceptions of or both economic growth and perceptions of growth. That's good, right? People feel richer. They are richer. Uh, so that should be a good thing. Um, people have more access to technology, uh, say, over the past decade or so. That should be a good thing. Many people have argued that independence from the United States, creation of different uh, organizations, assert, assertion of sort of Latin American sovereignty, if you will, that's a good thing. So all these things that are supposedly good. But if we put those as independent variables, independent variables potentially, and we put crime and corruption as dependent variables, then what we're saying is all these good things create really awful outcomes. Uh, and so I think it's it's worthwhile to start thinking about what other what else is going on. Um, I, I wouldn't start saying that economic growth, you know, makes crime worse. I suppose you could make an argument for that, but. Um, I think it's worthwhile to start thinking about if, if we have this depressing picture, if people are, people feel more insecure, uh, well, then what's causing that? Um, why, why do we have this sort of disjuncture between good things um, and bad things? And it may well be that it might be sort of the type of crime or the type of corruption. Um, I think that's a really valid point. But now, if we look at things like crime and corruption, as independent variables, well, then where is this leading us? Um, the one thing that really jumped out at me was the question of immigration. Uh, that at least people talk about leaving, though that made me wonder whether they really are leaving, or, you know, as people might say, they live somewhere for 30 years and for 30 years they're saying, I'm going to get out of this neighborhood, but they never actually do. Um, but is it, is it creating a continent on the move? Is it creating people who, well, obviously at least they're on the move in the sense that they're walking different ways to work, but um, what is this causing? Uh, is it causing, uh, other arrows I had is that the, the people are more concerned about crime, corruption at least is constant, um, but they seem to trust everything less. But then draw another arrow and say, well, okay, where, where's that leading us? Um, it's, it's also relevant to think about the fact that people are uh, oftentimes happy with their government. So what is this saying? Does this just mean that we li will live or Latin America will be a place where people still support the government? They don't want a coup, but they complain all the time, which is not unlike the United States, I suppose. Um, in the U.S., we see weird things like this, too, where, where they say 
you ask people, well, do you like Congress? Well, no, I hate Congress. Congress doesn't get anything done. Well, what do you think of your member of Congress? Oh, well, she's great. She's great. And so what that means is that if you look at what people say uh, as what they perceive, and they're, they, they, they say things don't work, but on different levels, they think things are, are okay. So in that sense, uh, is, there's not going to be some catastrophic outcome. But I think if we can pull back, then uh, we can start one or at least questioning or formulating hypotheses of if people have, if there's a decrease in democratic legitimacy, what does that actually mean? It sounds depressing, um, but w what is that actually going to lead to? Uh, and I think we could come up with different ways of measuring that with, say, a coup being the worst and apathy being something that's not great, but is um, certainly not as bad. Um, so in that sense, there's a lot that, um, that the data doesn't tell us. Um, or at least that what we need to do is we need to use this data and connect it to other things. Um, and think about, well, what are the causal relationships? Are there causal relationships? Um, in what sense does democracy bring things perhaps that people don't like? Um, or, you know, say the growth of a middle class, if you have more people have more money then you have, let's say more drug use or more, you know, consumerism or whatever the case might be. But uh, one thing too, I like about laptop data, uh, and I do this in my classes all the time is that it shows you in black and white a lot of things that are really counterintuitive. Uh, and so we have these sort of basic narratives of what's good, what's bad, what's working. And then you look at, okay, well, that's not what people think. Um, and so in that sense, that's what one really cool thing about it is it can spark discussions and spark questions about things that we really take for granted. Um, the second thing, uh, and this is really more about what the data helps tell us, uh, and this has been kind of a pet peeve of mine um, and uh, I, I've seen, it's not a pet peeve with the data, but a pet peeve of sort of general narratives. Um, having looked at and sort of commented on or blogged about or whatever, discussed in class, uh, laptop data over a number of years, one thing that always, always jumps out at me is that ideology doesn't seem to matter. So that when you look at, well, where are people insecure? Where are people happy? Where whatever? You'll see, okay, here's Colombia and Venezuela right next to each other. So you have Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Mexico. And from a general narrative, we tend to think, well, they we're going to see clusters. People ex expect more of one, one thing in certain types of countries, populist or leftist or whatever, and something else elsewhere. And in virtually all the types of tables that you see, for, and even the ones that were the, briefly, I know Liz had said it, you know, they were going to focus, there was going to be regional and not uh, comparative per se. But the, 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 the types of tables that you saw, um, even in this presentation, is that the countries we typically perceive as right or left or whatever, well, they don't cluster with their own sort of ideologies. And so what that suggests is that, um, certainly in the media, but I think perhaps even in, in academia sometimes, is that we overestimate the importance of populism or leftist or conservative. Um, and so that's why I think that the, what the data shows us is that there are a lot of regional trends and these regional trends are important to understand because they are universal. So that people are concerned in Venezuela, but they're also concerned in Colombia. Well, if that's the case, then it's reasonable to at least make the argument that ideology is washing out and that there's something else at play. So certainly we could talk about Bolivia or other countries where, for whatever reason, uh, you know, government has more margin of error or people have different uh, expectations of, say, freedom of expression. Um, but on the other hand, we, we don't seem to be seeing clear correlations between type of regime and what people are perceiving. Um, but that raises all kinds of really fascinating questions that uh, go along a bit with what uh, Eduardo was saying, I think. And that is, when you look at regional, both regional and comparative discussions or perceptions of democracy. In Venezuela, it tends to be quite high, but of course, we don't know what people are, what, what their vision of democracy necessarily is. 
So that's one way ideology can come into it. But on the other hand, I do think that it's important to uh, think about what Chris had said about the pink tide. And I think he was absolutely right about saying this lumpy. I love, I love the idea of some analysis being lumpy. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it sounded nice. But uh, is that it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work well. It's not smooth. Um, and so one thing I think that this data does is to tell us, okay, look, at, let's stop oversimplifying the idea of, of ideology. Let's stop talking about leftist governments as a block or conservative governments as a block um, because when you dig down on the ground level and look at what are people thinking about, they're thinking in ways that are very similar, even in countries with governments that are very, very different from theirs. And that suggests something that's broader. Um, and it also suggests then that the solutions to these problems are something that is, uh, it's, it's not simply changing the government or changing the constitution or things like that. It's something bigger and deeper that uh, in a certain sense is going to mean a, a much bigger challenge um, but that there could be regional approaches to these problems, because if we think in, in more universal terms, then that means that regardless of what type of government there is, maybe there are solutions, not one size fits all, but there are solutions that can work in some way according to local realities in different countries, regardless of ideology. Um, so with, with that, then uh, I'll just conclude by saying that the the one really cool thing about using this data is, I think, trying to connect it to bigger themes so that it, we, can, we can ask about, and I've even been trying to think in my head, how can we connect this even to U.S. policy, you know, as somebody who studies uh, U.S. Latin American relations, you know, and how do we, how can we think about this, how this connects to, say, U.S. influence, decline of U.S. influence or whatever, how does it relate to democracy? How does it relate to much bigger issues beyond just the nitty gritty of what people think or how polls are done? Um, but I think that it at least opens up the door to understanding Latin American politics in, in, a, in a newer way because this sort of data before was simply wasn't available or was scattered. And therefore we've over the years have made a lot of assumptions and a lot of these assumptions might be wrong. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we, we have time for a couple questions. Um, so please come up to the either of the mics. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of chairing the panel as you think about the questions and ask, ask Mitch and, and Liz sort of almost the question that begs here, which is, uh, would you suggest or are you suggesting that with the quadrant that Mitch showed that democracy at risk numbers, for example, have increased a little bit, that we might see future extra constitutional Honduran like types of disruption to the democratic order in the region? <laughs> I'm gonna defer to Mitch. <laughs> I, you know, um, the, the, uh, if I were sitting here running a government, I wouldn't want to have the numbers that I just showed, okay? I mean, you've been inside our government, and, and you know these aren't the kinds of things. Going from there to um, coups, we have to deal with there are countries without armies, okay? So right, there yeah. are, and, and, there, and there, therefore it's difficult to imagine that scenario. But what I think Eduardo pointed out is that you don't have to have unconstitutional arrangement formally when you can actually do a lot of suppression of civil liberties. I see. So there are a number of countries in which, referring to the media, in which effectively the media have been neutered and one, you know, the, the well, Franklin, you either have a free press or free government or other free press. The fact of the matter is, is that control has become more and more subtle rather than just going in and smashing the doors of the printing press and going in there and arresting the publisher. Now you have a, some firm of three individuals located somewhere in Spain at somewhere where that ends up being the owner of what had been a free and critical newspaper. And then a week or two later, the editorial staff has somehow or other changed. And now the newspaper is only saying nice things. So I'm worried, much more worried about 
that than I am of the military coming out of the barracks and overturning the system. And that the downtrends that we're seeing, it seems to me, create an environment in which those kinds of things can happen and be justified. So you're more concerned of Paraguay than Honduras. That is to say that the Paraguayan situation is more likely because of your numbers than the coup that we saw in Honduras. Everything is, remember, we've, we've had the luxury of sitting here and dealing with the merged data set, and we haven't pulled out the individual countries. Okay. But I did do the, the uh, preliminary re release of the Paraguay data a few months ago in Paraguay. And I had the uncomfortable position to sit in front of the police and the, and the Minister of Security and the Minister <laughs> and legislators. Of, of, of Justice <laughs> and saying, hey guys, um, police corruption is really going up in this country. But I had the satisfaction of the following day picking up the newspaper and having statements from the chief of police saying, this is serious and we have to look at this. That is to say, seeing how public opinion information, the public's voice, can turn uh, to have, the, have the, 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 the authorities react to that critique. Whether they do anything about it, well, presumably we'll find out when we do our next, next survey. Okay. Liz, do you want to say anything? Uh, I second what Mitch was saying, and I, I was just thinking that then the reverse side of things is, is to look at, to think about what the mass, what we can expect from the mass public over the next several years. Um, and one of the, it, that, that allows me to plug chapter six, in which we talk about an increase that we see in demand making on local government. So I think what we can expect is that, you know, we have a, an increasingly discontented citizenry. And to some extent, that discontent, discontented citizenry might fall into malaise or, or, or despair. But I think to, to a large extent, that discontented citizenry is, is, is going to continue to express uh, itself in, in terms of frustration and anger and, and demand making. It's interesting that demand making requests for assistance from local government in the, in the 2014 America's Barometer went sort of tracked downward while attending municipal I'm sorry, we tracked upward while attending municipal meetings tracked downward. So there's this there's a there's a frustration with, with, with local government, there's a frustration with national government. It's not gonna cause people to sit still for the most part, although I think that examining cross national variation and in, in, in sort of the in the ways in which people are are are, are reacting to these these downward trends will be interesting to do. But I think that what, one of the things that we will expect to see in the cycles us back into where Chris started is is visible signs of discontent. Good, thank you. Okay. Yes, Ed, please come to the mic. It's on. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the, the difference between perception, which, which your poll measures, and, and empirical reality, I guess, with a specific example of being Honduras. You know, over the summer, we were reading in the media that one of the drivers of the migration crisis was the high levels of crime and violence in a place like Honduras. But skimming your tables on the crime and violence, is, you know, Honduras is kind of like in the middle of the pack. It's, it's not particularly an outlier in terms of like the most dramatic, at least in the perception. So what accounts for that? Uh, is it media over, is it overblown in the media, the levels of violence there, or is it the perception of the people in that country that's just not meshing with reality? Well, this, this is, um, I mean, that's a great question to, to give us because um, it touches on a, a number of important things. And let me go there. One, one of those is that uh, we're, we're working on these country reports, and so we'll, we'll have these book-length reports released, so they'll populate our, our website. We'll have hard copies available as well over the next several months, and you'll be able to do a deep dive into any particular country. When you look at the overall rate of crime victimization for Honduras, you know, keep in mind that you're looking at a crime victimization rate that, that sort of bundles things together, all sorts of different types of, of crimes. So in Argentina, where a lot of people are concerned about and reporting burglaries, Argentina ends up sort of popping up above, you know, I'm not sure off the top of my head if it's above Honduras, but it, you know, it's going to pop up there. What we need to do to understand Honduras is to unpack the types of crime that people are experiencing. And then we also need to remember that crime is often concentrated, right? So people weren't sort of just leaving, you know, sort of 
at large for, from Honduras. They're leaving from particular parts of Honduras. And so there are pockets, and you can see them in the, in the survey data, and you can do more analysis on that, where things are, are worse, right? Our data are representative at the national level. They're also representative at the subnational level in large sort of geographic, geopolitical areas so that you can to, to dissect the, the country and look to see where things are, 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 are looking better and where things are, are looking worse. And that's some of the things that that type of analysis is often done in our country reports. I'll actually going to chime in there too. Um, so two years ago when we did the comparative report, um, I was writing the analysis. It didn't have the same focus on crime. And so I was writing the analysis there. And when I produced the initial, here's how they rank on how people are being crime victims. And the initial response was, there's no way on earth, it was the same response, there's no way on earth that South America ha has more crime than Central America. And so part of it was, as we just saw, with, that's why we, that's how this part of this survey got designed, to look at these types of crimes and to tap into these facts that different kinds of crimes pop in different countries. But then also what we did in 2012 was we just took the graph and broke it down. Let's just do national capitals. And so, for example, Mexico, it was, you know, top third for overall levels of crime and levels of insecurity, Mexico City, right there, and right at the top. You know, Honduras, if I remember right, it was about the same thing, where again, where you are in Honduras, the rates of victimization are very different. So combining the fact it's a different kind of crime, that you know, it's murder versus burg burglary versus other kinds, and then like Liz was just saying, these pockets, or it's, you know, that's why I like this, this question that the America's Barometer used this year, asking you specifically about your neighborhood and how you feel there and what's going on around you. And I think that's um, some of the richness of the data we can actually try and tap into some of these questions. Well, we are running out of time and lunch is waiting. Please join me in thanking the LAPOP team and our two discussants, Eduardo and Greg. <laughs>